Hello everyone, I am Niveta Nathyanandam, Assistant Professor in Department of Respiratory Therapy at Enapoya School of Allied Health Science. Today we are going to see about Pleural Effusion. At the end of this session, students will be able to understand about Pleural Effusion and its pathophysiology, the types of Pleural Effusion. We can also see about the clinical features presenting with the condition of Pleural Effusion, general management and respiratory therapy protocol in Pleural Effusion. Pleural effusion is accumulation of fluid in the pleural cavity. It is a very common clinical problem. What is this pleural cavity? Pleural cavity is a space between visceral and parietal pleura. The inner lining of the cavity is covered by a thin film of pleural fluid which will act as a lubrication. This thin layer of fluid is essential for smooth movement during respiration. So this is the pleural cavity, it has parietal pleura which is attached to the chest and visceral pleura which is attached to the lungs. The pleural cavity has uh, amount of pleural fluid, normal adults have 10 to 15 ml of pleural fluid. This fluid acts as lubrication, it is very similar to interstitial fluid. This fluid is very slippery due to presence of protein like albumin. Excess fluid that is collected in this cavity will be drained by the lymphatic vessels. What is the pathophysiology of pleural effusion? So normally a patient, a patient or a normal adult should have 10 to 15 ml of pleural fluid. Due to any other mechanisms, pleural fluid can collect excessively. So excessive pleural fluid is collected by one or more mechanisms. One is due to pleural injury. Another one is due to increased intravascular hydrostatic force or decreased oncotic forces. Next one is extravasation of fluid from the lymphatic or vascular structures or from any adjacent body compartment that can get inside the pleural space. There are two types in pleural effusion. One is transudative effusion, the other one is exudative effusion. So before going into what is transudative effusion and what is exudative effusion, we have to know what is this Starling principle. So the Starling principle holds that extracellular fluid movements between a blood and the tissue is determined by difference in two forces that is hydrostatic pressure and oncotic pressure. What is hydrostatic pressure? Hydrostatic pressure refers to the physical force of a fluid against their enclosing barriers that is force exerted by the blood on the walls. Oncotic pressure refers to the osmotic pressure generated by presence of proteinaceous solutes. So transudative effusion. This effusion is caused by increase in hydrostatic pressure or decrease in oncotic pressure. The causes where we can see this transudative effusion is we can see in heart failure, cirrhosis of liver, nephrotic syndrome and hypoalbuminemia. So where we will see this increased hydrostatic pressure that is increased force that blood exerts on the wall. So we will take heart failure. In case of heart failure what is happening is the heart is very weak to pump blood to the body. So what is happening is all the blood is backed up in the lungs. So back, uh, backed up blood in the pulmonary vessel can cause increase in pressure. When the pressure is increased, this will force the fluid from the capillaries into the pleural space. This is how increased hydrostatic pressure is causing a pleural effusion. Second one is oncotic pressure. So when we see oncotic pressure, oncotic pressure is the like pressure of the solutes like albumin cannot cross the capillary barrier. Okay. So by osmosis, by the process of osmosis, the fluids will move from low to high solute concentration. When this oncotic pressure is decreased, the fluid can leak into pleural space. So at what causes this oncotic pressure can decrease? It can be due to cirrhosis where the liver will produce very few proteins and in nephrotic syndrome where most of the proteins are eliminated by urine. Next one is exudative effusion. So we saw two causes of transudative effusion. Now we are moving on to exudative effusion. So exudative effusion causes are malignant pleural effusion, any bacterial pneumonias, tuberculosis, fungal disease, 
pleural effusion that is resulting from disease of gastrointestinal tract and pleural effusion due to collagen vascular disease. So how it is caused? This exudative effusion is caused due to inflammation of the pulmonary capillaries. Pulmonary capillaries are getting infected and they are getting inflamed. Because of this, there are larger spaces in the endothelial spaces. So because of the larger spaces, more fluid, immune cells and large proteins like LDH can leak out of the capillaries. So this exudative effusion is caused due to trauma, malignancy, inflammatory conditions and infection. Okay. Apart from transudative and exudative effusion, apart from other pathological fluids that can separate from visceral pleura are hemothorax, pyothorax and chylothorax. So empyma, it's also called as pyothorax. This is accumulation of pus in the pleural cavity. So empyma commonly develops as a result of inflammation. Thoracentesis may confirm the diagnosis and determine the specific causative organism for this empyma. This pus that is collected in the pleural cavity can be removed by thoracostomy tube drainage. Next one is hemothorax. Hemothorax is collection of blood in the pleural cavity. This is mostly caused by penetrating or blunt chest trauma. Any trauma to chest wall, diaphragm, lung or mediastinum can lead to hemothorax. A hemothorax is said to be present only when the hematocrit of pleural fluid is at least 50%. Next is chylothorax. So chylothorax is presence of chyle in the pleural cavity. This chyle is a milky liquid produced from the foot in small intestine during digestion. This chyle is normally taken up by the intestinal lymphatics and transported by thoracic duct to the neck. Any trauma caused to the neck or thorax or any occluding cancer to the thoracic duct can cause chylothorax. Now we will see clinical features of pleural effusion. So patient will present with increased respiratory rate that is tachypnea. This can be due to stimulation of peripheral chemoreceptors which can also lead to hypoxemia and patient will have increased heart rate and blood pressure. Patient will have a chest pain that is pleuritic chest pain and their chest expansion will be decreased. Patient will also present with cyanosis. Cyanosis is bluish discoloration of skin and patient will have a dry non-productive cough. When we do chest assessment, we can identify tracheal shift and on percussion there will be a very dull note due to presence of fluid and diminished breath sounds will be seen on auscultation. So clinical data obtained from uh, laboratory test in pleural effusion is first we will see pulmonary function test. So when we do pulmonary function test for a patient with pleural effusion, we can see a restrictive lung pattern. There, uh, Tidal volume will be normal or reduced, inspiratory reserve volume is reduced, expiratory reserve volume is reduced and residual volume is also reduced. So when you want to see the residual volume, total lung capacity and functional residual capacity, we can go with a test like body plethysmography or gas dilution test. ABG. So when a patient is having a small pleural effusion, that is a mild pleural effusion, the ABG will be acute respiratory alkalosis. But when the pleural effusion is more, that pleural effusion is massive, the patient will have increased PaCO2 and their patient will be so hypoxemic. So ABG will be acute ventilatory failure with hypoxemia. ABG will show acute respiratory acidosis. So next one is chest radiography. So while doing radiography, we can find blunting of costrophrenic angle. So when due to presence of fluid, this angle will be blunt. So fluid level will be seen on the affected side. Diaphragm will be depressed and mediational shift will be there to the unaffected side. So when pleural effusion is there, for example, if pleural, pleural effusion is on the left side, the mediastinal or tracheal shift will be towards the right. You can also see atelectasis in chest x-ray. So this is a PA view. 
So we can see the blunting of costophrenic angle because the fluid is displacing the air. So the costophrenic angle in this chest x-ray is blunt. Lateral decubitus. So the lateral decubitus radiography is recommended because if there is presence of any free fluid, by doing this we can see the fluid gravitates to the dependent part. So this is a more sensitive radiography for detecting free pleural effusion. Next is pleural fluid analysis. So we will perform thoracentesis to analyze the pleural fluid. So we can lo for loculated effusions, we can localize it by um, ultrasound and CT scan and we will obtain the fluid using thoracentesis. So a proper technique and sonographic guidance is required to minimize the risk of pneumothorax and other complications. So once we collect the fluid, pleural fluid by thoracentesis, we will do evaluation of the fluid. So fluid will be analyzed for pleural fluid chemistry that is pH of the fluid will be seen, fluid total protein corresponding to serum protein and fluid LDH level will be assessed fluid glucose corresponding to serum glucose will be assessed. Then we will do special chemistry to assess fluid amylase, triglycerides and cholesterol. Total and differential count of the fluid is also assessed. We will do cytological examinations to test the any malignancy or any presence of fungal infections and immunological studies like uh, fluid ANA and rheumatoid factor to rule out presence of any autoimmune disease and we will do special immunocytology for diagnosis of lymphoma and any and also tumor markers to assess malignant pleural effusion. So transudative pleural effusion and exudative pleural effusion are differentiated by comparing the chemistries of pleural fluid with those of blood. Effusion is considered to be exudative if the fluid protein and serum protein ratio is more than 0.5. Fluid LDH and serum LDH ratio is more than 0.6 and the fluid LDH is more than two third of the normal upper limit of serum LDH. If it meets this criteria, we will consider the effusion as exudative. If not, we will say the effusion is transudative. So the difference between a transudative effusion and exudative effusion is a transudative effusion develops when fluid from the pulmonary capillaries move into pleural space. This fluid is very thin and watery. It will contain very few blood cells and little protein. In transudative effusion, it can be due to heart failure or cirrhosis of liver or any nephrotic syndrome. So the pleura and lungs are not involved in a transudative effusion. So the pleural surfaces are not involved in producing a transudate. In contrast, exudative effusion develops when pleural surfaces are diseased. This fluid has very high protein and great deal of cellular debris. Exudative effusion is usually caused by inflammation, infection and malignancy. Now we will move on to the management of pleural effusion. The best way to resolve pleural effusion is to direct the treatment at what is causing it. So if heart failure is the cause of pleural effusion, we have to treat heart failure before treating the effusion. If lung infection is, cause, is the cause, we have to treat the lung infection by using antibiotics and if the infection is acute, effusion will resolve on its own. When the cause of the pleural effusion is not really evident, a chemical examination of pleural fluid may determine whether the effusion is transudate or exudate. If the fluid is transudate, treatment is directed to underlying problem. When the fluid is exudate, we can do a cytological examination and we can identify if there is any malignancy present. Respiratory therapy protocol. So first we will give oxygen therapy. So oxygen therapy is used to treat hypoxemia of the patient and it will decrease the work of breathing and also decrease myocardial work. Then lung expansion therapy. So in patients with pleural effusion, lung expansion techniques are administered to offset the alveolar atelectasis. It is helpful after thoracentesis and thoracostomy. So lung expansion therapy can be administered by incentive spirometer or by non-invasive ventilation. 
Next is pleurodesis. So in pleurodesis, a uh, sclerosant material that is a tall kind of material is injected into the chest cavity. This chemical substance will cause an intense inflammatory reaction. So this will make the surface of like visceral pleura and parietal pleura to get inflamed and adhere to the chest cavity. This will prevent and reduce recurrent pneumothorax and recurrent pleural effusion. So in today's class we saw about two layers of the pleura that is parietal and visceral pleura and which has pleural cavity and pleural cavity contains fluid of less than 15 ml. The pleural effusion can be exurative or transurative. So we will analyze the pleural effusion by doing thoracentesis. We will take the fluid and we can do a pleural fluid analysis. So this exudative and transurative effusions are differentiated by using criteria called lights criteria. The best way to resolve a pleural effusion is by treating its cause. The respiratory therapy protocol in treating a pleural effusion is oxygen therapy, lung expansion therapy and pleurodesis. These are my references. Thank you.